it's like everyone is moving the needle forward and it's exciting to be part of it. Business of Architecture, episode 391. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with the founding principal of Batoni Architects, Mark Batoni. Founded in 2004, Batoni Architects is a full service architectural practice based in Los Angeles, California. Their body of work ranges in building type and scale from interiors to master planning, and they are driven by a methodology defined by their explorative approach and curiosity for the unconventional. Batoni Architects is fast becoming one of the leading innovators for mixed-use residential schemes and urban development in Los Angeles, in part due to their ability to be able to unlock difficult urban sites. And also they have an incredible understanding of the business agendas, and they're able to work with those sorts of high caliber developer clients. In this episode, we discuss the firm's process in navigating through their shift into commercial work from residential, nurturing their relationship with developer clients, and how the practice has maintained its design sensibilities, despite the constraints that come with taking on commercial developer projects. We also inquire into what Mark sees as challenges the architecture industry will be facing in the next few years and what the future looks like for Batoni Architects. So sit back, relax and enjoy Mark Batoni. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Mark, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Great. Thanks, Ryan. Good to see you. So you started, you founded Mark Batoni, well, Batoni Architects in 2004. Um, You've had an incredible amount of work in a number of different sectors, commercial. You've been a pioneer, if you like in a lot of the multi-use retail work that's been happening in Los Angeles. And if we were to go back to 2004, when you first founded the business, what or how did the business begin? Ah, Well, that was a long time ago. Um, So we started the business uh, towards the end of 2004, beginning of 2005. And um, I was fortunate that my wife, she was working on a financial trading floor. And at that time, there was quite a bit of money that was being floated around between all the other people on the desks and things like that. And so my basically, I was approached by a couple of her coworkers to, you know, they realized that I was an architect and wanted us to kind of start working on their own homes. Mm. So it was actually, it kind of started from there. We started with a couple of small remodels, then they kind of grew in scale. Then it started moving into additions. And then from there, it was just one of those things that just kind of kept progressing. And I mean, at the first I was originally, I was just working out of my studio apartment. Um, And then it quickly just sort of morphed into, oh, I now I need to get out of this apartment. I need to get back into an office space. And so I just slowly evolved from there. And since then, it's been kind of a steady stream. It's had its ups and downs, of course, uh, Mm. particularly 2008 and 2009. Yes. Um, But we were able to weather the storm. And uh, so far, we're kind of came out on the other end of it doing pretty well. In in terms of the moving into more commercial work from the private residential sector, how did you start to make that kind of bridge? And how did those larger projects start to, to come to you? Was it something that you kind of had a a clear vision of here, we're going to go after this, or was it more organic? It, it actually was completely organic. So again, uh, one thing I've, I've been pretty fortunate in some of my uh, sort of chance encounters with people. So um, our first multifamily project uh, came out of working with uh, a residential client. Mm. And that client, we did their home. It was a ground up house. They were super pleased. And they said, hey, um, can you do this? And I'm like, of course we can. Um, and so we kind of started with that. And then that same developer kind of brought along another group of projects. And so we kind of just kept growing alongside of that. And as our work started getting out into more visible onto the city and signs are up around job sites, 
more people started to call. So it was in a lot of ways, it wasn't necessarily something specific that we were going after, but we, we definitely saw, particularly being here in Los Angeles and housing is definitely a, a critical need. It, it began, it became very clear that that's an avenue that we should be kind of work focused, more focused on. Mm. And, and how, how many of those clients are, have became kind of long-term clients or repeat clients? Well, we've been really fortunate on that. So we have at one point, I mean, we've, we have about four large developer clients that we're doing, I think, upwards of like five to six projects each. So that's actually been really successful. So hopefully that at least is a sign that we're doing something right with our clients yeah. and they're happy they come back. And, and the success of those projects as they become sort of as they come on board and come online, mm. um, it's kind of proof of concept. And so now other people are kind of approaching us in that manner. How, how have you nurtured those relationships or why do you think that you've been successful in having those clients not leave and go somewhere else? Well, I think, you know, the, with the developers, it's, it's a very specific uh, clientele. And so, you know, one of the things that we do is we really try to figure out what it is that the client wants. Um, in particular with developers, there's a lot of red tape, bureaucracy, uh, neighborhood council appeals and understanding what those things are and sort of how we can kind of guide them through that. And we try to do it in an efficient manner. We understand that time's important to them, time's critical, and there's like a return on investment. But what we try to do is we try to sort of bring them along that whole process, uh, give them a clear sort of uh, set of deliverables, and then um, sort of, you know, bring the project, um, I guess, um, you know, to completion. And so from that, I think part of it is, I think that also, I think the, the team that we have in place, the personality of the groups, I think that all kind of goes into the stew. But I think really it's about giving our clients the results that they need. How, how long was it? before you started doing that kind of commercial work? Was there a long, was it kind of, you know, you did a few residential projects and then you, you were kind of catapulted into doing the, into the commercial arena or did it happen over a much longer time period? Yeah, so at that point we were looking at, it was about nine years into the practice. Mm -hmm. And, and um, again, it kind of came to us organically. Uh, and then from there, it's it's interesting because probably right now, 75% of our work is actually in this mixed use development uh, category. And what is, what, with that particular type of work, how does it differ, say, from the private residential in terms of how you liaise the relationship that you need to have with the client? Yeah, it's a completely, in some ways, it's a very different animal. Um, uh, but it, it's the same way, there are some similarities. I mean, I, I think the, the difference is that you're dealing with a larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely more uh, financially driven, I think, on the development side. And not to say that the residential clients aren't. Um, it's just a different animal where there's, with the single family residential projects, clearly there's an emotional attachment. It's about making dreams come true. It's about delivering something that people have wanted, something people would aspire to have. Yeah. Um, aspire to have. And on the, on the development side, it's really about maximizing the return on investments uh, and what that is. And that's kind of the, the driving factor, particularly as like fees in uh, construction costs increase along the way as they have in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, it even becomes even more important to kind of negotiate those things for our clients. It's really interesting when you look at your portfolio of work, obviously there's a clear, you know, a very strong design sensibility that underpins the entire practice and what you do. And obviously when you start working with commercial developer types of clients, that's often one of the hardest things to maintain, right? Because you do get into this financial conversation. You are talking about, you know, with kind of tough commercial parameters. How have you as a practice been able to maintain and assert that, you know, the, the kind of design intelligence, if you like, with your, with those commercial clients? Are they yeah, I think, I mean, that's a good question. I think what's, what we try to do is we understand that there's, uh, we kind of, we give ourselves, we kind of define a certain group of things that we can exploit. 
Um, we realize that if we just design anything that we want, clearly maybe the client won't be able to afford it. And so then there's no point in us doing it because ultimately the project's not going to happen. Mm. So what we try to do is we try to keep the uh, unit-based typology, keep that kind of very consistent and maybe repetitive and something that's like proven. Mm -hmm. um, but we try to exploit things like framing, um, um, exterior, you know, here in California, we do a lot of stucco. Um, so we try to keep the palette very minimal, something so it's cost effective. Framing doesn't really cost that much more to do. It's just about how you shape the building. Mm -hmm. And so we've really tried to kind of make projects that I think are kind of uh, minimal. They're simple, um, but through their simplicity actually has some beauty. It, has it become something like your, your signature, if you like, that the 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 developers actually quite keen to have because they re they recognize the the value that it brings in terms of you know when they're in the post sale process or when they're letting when letting the projects out yeah we actually it's funny now that as we've been doing more and more of these projects it's it's really kind of fun to have the clients uh, reference our projects when they come in as something that they like um, i think one of the things is that uh, we found that there's there's multiple approaches to doing these things. Uh, you know, a lot of times on the larger mixed use projects, you kind of throw a lot of things at it. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of distract. And so we try to make things that are a lot more pure, a little bit more honest in terms of their aesthetic. And people seem to react to it. I think maybe perhaps the developers, they look at it as it's definitely pared down. So there's an economy there, um, but also there's a simplicity and a beauty to it that they respond to. How how do you then get one of these clients over the over the line, if you like? So when they first approach you, what's the kind of process that you go through in terms of courting a developer client and some of the things that you've learned, the do's and don'ts, if you like? Well, now we I mean, one of the, I think what we've done now is we kind of have a much more structured process because there's a lot of people in this city that are doing this kind of work. And so yeah. especially in a place like Los Angeles, we have to figure out ways to differentiate ourselves. So what we really try to do is, you know, we kind of have our, uh, sounds corny, but almost like a Batoni blueprint to some degree, um, where we have is kind of, you know, we, we first, we kind of, um, we have a sort of a discovery call where we talk to them. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do is at that point, trying to figure out what exactly they're trying to achieve in that, in that, in that call and understand what their directives are, what their motivations are for doing the development and how they're, they're going about that. And then what we try to do, because we want to show a sort of sense of competency. We, we, we always try to work with them to do a kind of a feasibility study to kind of show them proof of concept, to show them how these, how we can kind of um, take a project from their plot of land, maximize its potential, show what it has. I think a lot of times what's great is a lot of our clients might come to us and they kind of have a preconceived idea of what the project might be. Mm -hmm. And then through that feasibility study, we're kind of able to take it uh, a step further. And so usually that goes a long way in sort of gaining their confidence. And then from that point, it's actually quite easy to kind of convert that because now you already have engaged their trust. They understand that you know what their problems are and they have, um, you've kind of established a baseline competency for that. How do you know when it's not a fit? Ah, I think, you know, it's not a fit when the first question is how much you would charge for this project. Um, I think that's right out of the gate. Um, I think that that's, that's it. And so usually, you know, you, you can definitely get a sense now that um, they just want to see a number or it's going to be financially, it's just going to be whatever that is, it's going to be uh, financially motivated. And that's fine. And we're fine with that. But at the same time, I think you need, um, I think maybe that's when you realize that maybe the, we have different expectations of what that, what that might actually be. So if you find yourself in that situation where, and I can imagine that that's quite common, that the developers are kind of, you know, they're upfront, what they want to know is how can we keep the architect's costs reduced to the minimum as possible. Right. It, when that happens to you, or you find yourself engaging in that kind of dialogue, how do you get yourself out of that? Or, is, or have you found ways where actually you can start to educate the client and move them into beyond just looking at the price? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, I mean, the one thing we try to do is we try to push that conversation later on. Right. So again, it's like bringing them in to first things, bringing them into the office, seeing how we work, 
adopting the kind of technology that we're leveraging in order to execute the project. Mm. Whether it's the BIM model, the 3D prints, the VR headset, whatever it is that we're doing, it's all part of so much more that I think is a typical deliverable. Mm -hmm. And to understand that you're getting this value so that whether or not it's we're using ARCHICAD in the office, which has been a great tool for us, um, they can see that there's there's um, their project is going to have a level of attention um, that probably is different from other firms. And I think that's 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 usually the key. And once I can make that connection to them, then mm -hmm. I think it's a much easier sell and they, they get it. How has the office grown over since 2004? When, when oh. did you start first taking on employees and at what scale are you at now? Yeah, I think uh, we had, so right now, so start off just me. Uh, we, right now we're currently at 13 people in the office. Uh, we probably could be at least have a couple more people mm -hmm. um, uh, to, for, for the new workload that's coming on. Um, you know, to be honest with you, Ryan, when we started, it was kind of like, just, I knew I needed someone. I was actually, I was teaching in the office, uh, teaching at USC. Uh, which was uh, here teaching uh, architecture. That's studio. a good pipeline. <laughs> it's a great pipeline. And so, you know, basically I was looking at some of our, you know, talented students that would have in studio and say, hey, um, what are you doing on Tuesdays and Thursdays? Because <laughs> I, you know, I know you have the time. And so we would bring those people on board and it was great. Um, and it was fun because we were running it much like a studio. Mm. But as you start to get more and more work and the projects start to grow in scale, you realize that there needs to be something, there needs to be much more leadership in place. And so uh, at one point there was a time where I just said, okay, I can't teach anymore. It was, it was kind of a decision. It's like either I need to be in the office or I teach and that kind of schism was kind of difficult. Mm. Um, so what we would do is definitely we would use kind of, we leveraged youth at that time for sure. Um, but then again, you find myself, you know, I'm finding myself sort of having to train everyone. Yeah. And that also starts to become kind of a time sink. And so then you realize, okay, I have to find someone with more experience that can kind of sit between the junior staff and myself. And so from that, we've just kind of been filling that out piece by piece. Uh, now the office is, has a little bit more structure than it did in its infancy. Um, now we, it's, we have me as the principal, we have two senior associates, and then we have the staff that kind of is filtered through that. So one of the nice things is that in any given point, our clients at least have a minimum of three points of contact for the smaller projects, as many as five. Mm -hmm. And we're very open about that. Our clients can reach out to them at any time. Uh, but that way, always there's always somebody that will facilitate a response for them. And putting in that kind of level of leadership and, and structure, when did you know that, that was, there was a time to do that? Or was it something that kind of, again, happened more organically? And It, uh, it, it, it happened organically. Um, however, it quickly became obvious that it needed to somehow be much more structured. Mm -hmm. um, and I think more, more to the point was to make sure that everyone understood what their role was in the office. So I think the leadership, understanding what their key objectives were and making sure that those objectives get translated to the junior staff and their objectives get identified as well. And I think once that starts to happen, then it starts, this thing starts to be a much more well-oiled machine and you start to see things where um, now it's kind of nice where I can kind of step away take the time to actually go out and do the business development and reach out to the clients and do the things that I'm, I think that I'm pretty good at. Mm. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been really rewarding to see that growth. You, you mentioned earlier that obviously you weathered the storm of 2008 and can you give us a little bit of insights of the sorts of things, you know, what happened during that period? Cause this is, this is often such a sort of defining moment in lots of businesses. I mean, many businesses were created during that period yeah, yeah. But also there's, you know, a tremendous amount of knowledge that comes from being able to survive uh, a recession like that. What were some of your key takeaways from, from weathering that storm and how has it kind of influenced your leadership now? Well, that was, that was such an interesting time um, for a number of reasons. Well, one, we were, we were working on a project in Taiwan Mm. We're actually doing a, a very large scale project right in the middle of Taipei, which was super exciting. And at that point, the office was actually, I think we were up to I think uh, close to 16 or 17 people in the office. 
And it was all hands on deck. And we were literally going back and forth, flying back and forth from Taipei to Los Angeles. It was great. We had offices. We were splitting our time. And uh, it was frenetic, but it was exciting. And then all of a sudden, I get a call. The global economy has exploded. The project is paused. (laughs) And I had to go from 16 down to four, just like that. I mean, this was in a matter of months. And to be honest with you, the one thing I didn't know is I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know how to let people go. I didn't know yeah. how long the reserves really last. And the next thing you know, you find out, you're like, oh my gosh, like now I've gone, you know, I've just eaten through all that reserve cash that we have. And it's like, you know, and I didn't know, I didn't know how to let somebody go. Mm. I felt horrible. I thought that I was like, you know, they're going to be in dire straits because everyone else was losing their job. Yeah. There were no other jobs to go to. So it was just, it just, the burden at that time was, was immense. Um, and uh, the one thing that came out of that more than anything is I was like, I, I don't want to do this again. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily about like the money drag, but I was like, I can't take on, I don't want to have a, an office that sort of expands and contracts that's based on a particular project. Mm. You know, I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen now. I've witnessed it more and more times from other firms around and you start to realize that's not the way to structure an office. Um, it's tough on resources. It's tough on finances. It's tough on the emotional toll of your employees, not to mention my own, mm. um, but just to have that burden. So the one thing that came out of that, I think, was this idea that, you know, kind of slow growth, you know, bend, but don't break. You add people on in a very methodical way. Mm -hmm. It's a very systematic way. And then we've just, what's been great is we've just continued to grow since then. So it's been a consistent growth. It hasn't, you know, we haven't, um, um, we haven't, you know, compressed at all. So it's, it's been, it's been great. And so I think that was really the biggest turning point. I was like, okay, this is great. There's something glamorous about this. Super cool. But, um, let's take a step back. Maybe we just a little more of a slow, slow burn. Did any, did you get any of those employees back or was it kind of basically you're rebuilding the team with almost, you know, entirely new people? We did. We managed to bring a couple people back. Uh, Fortunately, fortunately, a lot of the staff at that time were a lot of interns because we were doing a lot of model making. So they were still in school. So that was great. Um, but the core group we were able to bring back and to this day, some of that senior leadership is still here in the office. So that, that's been great. So, you know, this is almost 10 years later. So, yeah. Amazing. And and what what was some of your, you know, how has your role evolved from, you know, those early days through 2008 and, and to now, and to now, are you still very much involved in the hands-on production of work and in design or has, has your kind of set of responsibilities significantly migrated? It has. I mean, I think the responsibilities have definitely migrated. Um, production wise, um, right now, that's something that I don't really have the time, nor do I, am I clearly not probably the most competent person. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of redlining and detailing, those are things that I still do uh, to make sure that there's a consistency to the drawings and also a competency to them and just make sure that things are going out the door correctly. So that's something that I still have a little bit of OCD on and want to control, um, which I can't seem to help myself. Um, But, you know, what I, what I, but I am finding myself, I get to do two of the things that I enjoy. One is I really enjoy the sales process. I enjoy engaging with clients. I enjoy the discourse of architecture, being able to, you know, sort of bring people on and sort of explain our process and how we work. Um, And I also enjoy designing. So, you know, we still try to keep somewhat of a studio environment where, you know, opinions are heard. We have pinups, we talk about projects, we sit around, um, and we still prioritize the actual design product when it's all said and done. How did COVID affect you guys over the last couple of years in terms of, you know, office culture and maintaining that production and close level of working to, with each other? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I'm not going to lie. It's been a burden. I'm sure it's been a burden for most people, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's like one day we're all in team and the next day it's ghosts. So everything is completely like, you know, everything's fragmented. And um, fortunately, uh, we had already had an initial investment in technology. Mm-hmm. So we were able to really 
you know, gravitate immediately to the cloud, which was great for production. So people on ARCHICAD, they were using bin cloud and the server and being able to access the files. So there wasn't much loss of production really. Um, we did have to get a few extra subscription fees here and there so we could communicate that we didn't have. Um, culturally, it was interesting because I think there was a lot of things going on, right? I mean, one is the office, right? You're scared what's going to happen because you don't know. The other one is people's mental health. People are scared because they're scared they're going to die. They don't know what's happening. You know, news is constantly changing. And the kind of the fear of the unknown. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, what we tried to do is we tried our best to connect. I know the first few weeks of the pandemic, I was sending beer on Fridays to everybody's house, <laughs> having it delivered kind of as a coping mechanism. So that was great. Uh, you know, people seem to appreciate that. I think uh, it was interesting to me how uh, alcohol sales became an essential service that was open alongside like <laughs> fire and firefighting and police. But yeah, you know, but uh, BevMo was something that, you know, you could actually go to. Um, so that was actually something we tried. We, we pressed a lot on. We tried to do some online activities. But as you know, and I'm sure a lot of companies that how do you maintain that? How do you keep that going? Um, and so it did kind of morph a little bit. Um, you know, you could tell that there was a I think people I mean, I think people were thinking a lot of things. They're thinking about their future. Right. As many people are doing now, um, thinking about you know, their career path, like, where is that? And so one of the things I tried to do during that time was to try to, you know, stay positive, um, still keep trying to bring in work. So that there's, you know, and trying to really make it clear to everyone that, you know, we're going to get out of this, that we can kind of, you know, move this along and I think we'll be okay. And, you know, we're back in the office now. Um, that's also been kind of an adjustment, right? Yeah. Um, people are, you know, uh, people just, just the simple things of like putting on pants that aren't, you know, don't have a stretchy waist or an elastic <laughs> waist, and, you know, and like trying to, you know, and get to the office on time. It's been a little bit of adjustment, but I think now after a few months, I think the, the cobwebs have worn off and I think people are, you know, are actually kind of excited to be in the office. Mm. Um, and so that's been good. What, what for you are some of the key ingredients or the thing or the sort of important disciplines to maintain in terms of nurturing office culture or business culture or you know the the Batoni way of doing things the, you know your your values if you like yeah well so values is as you might know some of the work with the business of architecture that we've been doing it's been super gratifying to work on this. Um, is actually establishing those things. So we we didn't have, when we started, we didn't have a vision statement. There weren't core values. Um, but over the last year, I've been kind of working towards developing those because I understand now probably more than ever. Yeah. People need to understand their place in the world. They want to understand the direction that they're going. They want to, they want to vision their future. They want to, they want to understand that they're part of something that's maybe something that has meaning, something that has 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 a future. They, they you know that they they think that okay, the guy you know that's up in his room that he's actually the lights on and he's actually worried about me and he's trying to bring in work and he's supporting this. And so I think it's that confidence that's been great. Um, you know, only for myself, but also for the team. I mean. I think at first they probably thought something was going on with me. I was having a midlife crisis. All of a sudden, I'm <laughs> I'm expounding core values. I'm I'm uh, you know going around the, the the meeting table saying, okay, what's our core values, and just pointing at people at random. Um, and I think at first there was a lot of what's going on. Um, I think now they're like, oh, okay, this guy actually cares. And so yeah. you know, and I think that and this is maybe this is a place where I can I can grow into an architect. Um, you know, and maybe even I don't have to go start my own firm because there's a platform here that maybe they can participate in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's been a real, uh, sound investment for us. Amazing. In terms of, uh, international work, you mentioned in 2008, you were doing work in, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Are you, what's your kind of reach of work at the moment? Are you predominantly based in Los Angeles or do you? I know, I know that you've got work in Charleston and other, other states. What, yeah. What does, what does your sort of landscape of work look like at the moment and how, and again, what kind of challenges does that bring with it? 
Yeah, so we have we have projects. Most of the work is here in Los Angeles. We have stuff in some of the outlying areas around some of the communities within the state of California. Uh, we do have one outlier project that's in Charleston. It's a large, almost a whole city block that we're redeveloping, which is mm -hmm. huge. And I think that project in particular is, is probably going to be one of the more, um, I think that's one of the more groundbreaking projects that we're working on because it's a completely different scale. Um, so that that's super exciting. Um, look, I mean, the ambition clearly for me is to grow outside of just Los Angeles. I mean, I, we just love to participate in the act of design and architecture and want to you know, work in communities and, 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 and to me, the newness of going into another community and learning about it and being able to sort of, um, you know, digest what it is that they're about and that ethos and being able to kind of design something as a response. That's super exciting, uh, both intellectually, you know, I think, and, and, and practically. Um, so definitely we're trying to grow that way. I mean, we have, you know, one of the nice things about being in Los Angeles is that it is a financial center of mm -hmm. the world. So there's a lot of money here. And so um, a lot of our uh, developer clients here are looking to go elsewhere. They're looking to go into other cities, whether it's Austin, Texas, or San Antonio, or Denver, Colorado. And so they want to go there, and but they want to take us, because they like working with us, they want to take us along for the ride. Um, they think that there's something there, there's a California ethos or aesthetic that, you know, is necessary. But it's been really cool that our clients wanting to bring us along and not necessarily just defaulting to the local architecture scene. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's kind of our next play in order to kind of, you know, get to those new, um, those new cities. When you start engaging in work in a, in a different state, what are the sorts of things that you as a practice need to be aware of that's different from working on your home turf, if you like? Yeah, well, it's a completely, you know, Charleston's a great example. And one thing just as a caveat, just, just to mention is like, we work with local architects. So right. we want to make partnerships in the local municipalities. I think that that's critical. I mean, the idea of just going in and pretending as if we know what's going on here is just, I think, absurd. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it could even be perceived as being rude. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the idea that we really want to team up with architecture firms that are like-minded, but have local knowledge um, that are just as excited about the design process and what we do and, you know, and we're and vice versa. So we try to navigate those, those, those things along the way. I mean, Charleston's a perfect example. I mean, relative to, I mean, you couldn't get two broader sort of ideologies. You have one, which is one of the oldest cities in the United States, and you have one of the youngest cities in the United States and you're pairing it. And so, you know, you look at sort of uh, contextualism. I mean, here in Los Angeles, it's, 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 you know, it's scattershot. There really isn't much. It's a hundred year old city. Yeah. And meanwhile, you're working within context. It's 500, 600 years old. And so there's a very, very different sort of um, uh, cultural exchange that's happening there. I mean, mm. uh, you know, Charleston, I think within, you know, we're, we're dealing within a peninsula, within a three mile radius, there's probably about 15 different neighborhood councils that you're dealing with, that all are stakeholders and shareholders and neighbors that have opinions. Here in Los Angeles, you have that. Mm. However, it's not about sort of, you're not talking about issues of historical preservation. You're talking about how many cars am I being able to fit in there because everyone has a car here and it's such a, you know, an automobile culture driven city. So mm -hmm. it's just what the concerns of those different communities is so completely polar opposite. And so it's really important to one listen, but I think it's also important to partner with people that, that have that, that have that knowledge. Well, with those, with the client that you're working with in Charleston, was that a client that you'd worked with previously then in, in Los Angeles that wanted to, as you say, bring it is. Yeah. So yes, exactly. So it's a client here in Los Angeles that is partnering with um, a developer, I think in New York city. And so it's this whole group, but they're leading the charge and they wanted to bring us into the project. Yeah. And, and, and how did you make sure that you've got the right collaborator? How did you go about finding a local architect is it something like what's the actual process that you go about doing that are you are you putting advertising out or are you you know no, yeah like yeah we haven't we haven't tried that strategy we haven't done that but i think what we've what we try to do is we we you know first thing is we go to the aia we look at the awards we look at the projects that are being done we look at the ones that are interesting the ones that it kind of have a slightly 
different um, approach. You can tell that there's some, some serious thought that's been put into the project. Yeah. And we identify those and we kind of reach out to them. And we're like, hey, this is what we do. You know, we, we like what you're doing. Is this something that you'd want to work in? And I, you don't, you know, with this project in particular, not everybody had the same response. Not everybody wanted to participate at that scale. Not everybody wants to partner. I think it's, you know, for a lot of architecture firms, the idea of partnering and doing this local design architect, executive architect relationship has it, I'm sure, you know, there's plenty of contention there. It could be. Mm. Um, so you got to find people that like really the egos are kind of off to the side. Um, I mean, I think we all have a little bit of ego. I think it's just how, what those things are and how those things get expressed is, is kind of the important thing. Yeah. What 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 kind of um, makes sure that that relationship is solid, or what kind of working methods have you found? You know, ensure the, a good delivery of a project with a with a local architect. With a local architect, I think the most important thing is well, I would say first communication, obviously. Mm -hmm. Second, I think it's really understanding the technology and being on board. I think you have to be compatible in that sense, meaning that you're both working within the BIM sort of model. You're able to communicate those, the files are sort of able to communicate. I think those things, I think there needs to be a fundamental kind of workflow process. And I think that's key. Um, I think that the design and the aesthetic stuff, I think it, it's, it, it is important, but I think that that kind of isn't nearly as important as figuring out the work processes in place. And so we've developed, you know, from just, you know, nomenclature of drawing sheets from, you know, how we write specifications, details, um, title blocks, those kind of things, having those as a consistent kind of thing, I think is important to kind of develop. Have you been on the other side, like the local architect? We, we, we are, we're actually, um, it's kind of exciting too. We have another project that's uh, on the boards um, that I, I can't speak too much about. Um, but what's great about it is that we're working now with a world renowned architect mm -hmm. uh, working as the executive architect. And so that's actually interesting too, because it's someone that we admire, we um, aspire to be more like, and so the idea that, you know, someone chose us to kind of be part of that conversation is really exciting as well, because not only is it just sort of we're identifying who we want to work with, but somebody actually wants to work with us, which is kind of cool, too, to know that people like us. Yeah. How, how, so how did that kind of relationship uh, emerge? Well, that one, again, very happenstance. So it was just a friend of mine, a colleague um, that I had gone to grad school with and just, you know, we maintained a relationship and somebody approached them about it. They were sort of in a tangential field and they were looking for someone that was, you know, like-minded for this particular project. And they said, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you call Mark and his team? And uh, they did. They also talked to a number of other influential firms here in the city um, and so that was also cool to know that we also were able to compete, uh, not only, um, you know, for that project and get that, but also compete locally with other firms that we admire and knowing that we were part of that pretty cool sandbox. Mm. Yeah. But what's, what's the, the, the kind of local environment like in Los Angeles? I mean, obviously you're in, you're in one of these hotspots in the world where there is, you know, thousands of architects, thousands of brilliant yeah. architects yes. as, as well. How do you like, you know, what's, what's the relationship with your, with your colleagues in terms of competition, in terms of being able to stand out? What are some of the challenges that you, that you find yeah. and how have you found to navigate around that? It, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to, I mean, uh, it's an amazing place to be. Being in Los Angeles is incredible. I mean, it's the reason why I moved. I originally, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. When I graduated college, I knew I wanted to go east or west, but there was just something amazing about something. Well, I should say, I remember seeing some of my colleagues that went to New York and a couple like students that kind of left and they went east or west and you'd see them come back. And, you know, the New York students were definitely the kids. They were much more sort of, Beaten you know, down. <laughs> you down, exactly, you know. And, and, you know, and the, the guys who went to California, they come back with flip flops and you're just like, you know, it's great. <laughs> it's just a completely different thing. Yeah. Um, but what's what was really interesting for me is that L.A. is definitely celebrates youth. And I thought that was what was really exciting about it is like you could be I mean, I started the office when I was 30 years old. I mean, I you know, it was something that 
I don't think would have been possible if I were in New York per se, mm. or some or London where you're at. I feel like, you know, people like there. I remember I did have one client who told me that he liked his architects, like his cardiologists, like very gray and old. And I said, okay, cool. All right. So clearly I'm not the guy for you. So, um, but there's a lot of people, I think a lot of it was with all the creative other industries, the ancillary creative industries, whether it's Hollywood or um, tech companies that are now here, there is this kind of energy of, of progress and creativity. And, and so there's a, there's, there's a healthy client base for that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is what, you know, back to your, your original question, which was, you know, as an architectural community, it's, 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 it's invigorating because everyone's thinking not necessarily about the same things, but how to different approaches to tackle similar problems, whether it's through housing typologies um, that are super exciting or methods of construction. It's like everyone is, is, is moving the needle forward and it's exciting to be part of it. And, you know, how do you make a, how do you make a, some noise so people notice you? It, it's a little bit tough. I mean, you have Frank Gary down the street, you know, you have Tom Main. I mean, so it's like you have these people, uh, these icons and the reasons why you're here. Um, yeah. And they're still doing amazing work to this day. So it, it's tough. Um, but like I said before, it's like it's a slow burn. And eventually you kind of, I think, as work gets done and as long as it's good and it's consistent, I think eventually it'll sort of rise um, rise to a level that's at least seen. Brilliant. What's your, your, the, the, the future look like for Batoni Architects? Where do you see the next sort of 10 years going and what some of the strategic decisions or things that you're starting to think about of where you want to see the business and how it's kind of structure evolves? Yeah. I mean, I think the types of work as well. Yeah. I mean, with the workload, I think is, is kind of the most exciting thing is because we've noticed that there's, we're, we're rapidly scaling up, Mm. um, which I think is cool. I mean, the original projects, batch of projects were more like um, um, urban infill. So these were sort of residential lots that were kind of, you know, um, uh, pulled together. And then we do like a single apartment building, but now we're doing commercial corners with mixed use development and residential on top. And those are getting bigger. Now we have a project where we're doing that with also a hospitality component. So, you know, I think the, I think definitely if you're working in Los Angeles, housing is important. How you attack housing, I think is important. How you approach it. Um, I mean, we've been fortunate that we're doing a lot of work. Uh, we're doing a lot of, I think, somewhat experimental it's not a new idea right but we've been doing a lot of co-living projects in los angeles which is different from i think a lot of our other firms in town that are the work that they're doing um and that's been really exciting so it's like you know not only do all of these projects that we're working on have an affordability component to them Mm -hmm. uh, in order to increase the density but then there's also this thought going behind of like maybe looking at it on the granular level of how uh, people coexist and how people live together and and what are the payoffs and the benefits of that, whether it's through affordability or efficiency um, or also just the social interaction that goes on. I think it's it's really exciting. And I what I'm excited to see is how co-living, particularly the co-living, how that part of the business can expand and actually create its own unique typology of a building. Mm-hmm. Has a different business model ever been in your mind for the company? So, for example, you're working with a lot of um, housing developers. Have you ever thought about wearing the development hat yourself or is that not something that has appealed to you? Yeah, not, I mean, not really. <laughs> I mean, it probably should, right? Because, I mean, we, we're solving a lot of these problems. Mm. Um, but I, I personally, I kind of like to stay in my lane. I feel like, yeah. you know, I, you know I'm, I got this. Um, and to me, well, it's nice different... to hear an architect say that actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it, well, it's, it's, it's interesting when I, I've, you know, I've spoken to many, uh, practices and often some of the ones who were doing the most successful work with large scale housing developers have made a clear distinction of, you know, what we're going to, we don't want to be in competition with our, with our clients and right. our area right. of expertise is here. I mean, that's a lot of risk. That's a different kind of risk. We're, you know, we're doing this over here and actually you know, providing a service for this. Industry. Yeah. I mean, my, my father was a builder 
And so early on, I knew that I, you know, and I would work with him and on his crews and things like that. Um, early on, I realized I like construction. I like being in that industry, but it wasn't something necessarily that I, I want. I didn't want, I saw the struggles that he had. And so I just was like, okay, well, I don't want to be a builder, but I still like being around construction. And so that's kind of how, even how I found myself into, you know, becoming an architect. Just to take a kind of step back a little bit and to look at the industry as a whole at the moment, and you've had the experience, you know, teaching and running your own practice and working for other businesses. What do you see some of the challenges that the architecture industry is facing in the next, you know, five to 10 years and things that you would like to see shift on an industry basis? Yeah. Wow. That's a loaded question, isn't it? I mean, I think it's, uh, there's a lot there. I mean, on first we're coming out of this pandemic yeah. and clearly there's been plenty of stuff that's been written about the great resignation. Um, and people are like leaving the job force. And so I think that there's, there's, uh, there's something, there's something scary about that, but there's also something amazing about that. Because on one hand, I sit here and I go, okay, great. So people are now, you know, it's like the day to day, it's hard to find someone to come into the office, sit down and actually produce. And we have all this work, right? So there's that. But at the same time, there's a kind of a bright spot to it, which is it's also forced us to figure out ways to become more efficient in the way that we do our work. Yeah. So what's really been wonderful is like, you know, just from like small little processes, while we're not able to find people to come into the office, we just found smarter ways to do the things that we were doing. And we're like, probably we wouldn't have done these things if we didn't have this sort of thing that was pressing against us, right? This sort of conflict that we had to deal with. So I think that that's super cool. Um, I do think that I, I see it changing a little bit more from, from the younger people that are coming into the office. because. I know I always had my own issues with sort of academia and the way we were prepped to kind of go on to the world. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I taught for a while and I, mm -hmm. I love the sort of the larger discourse of architecture. Yeah. However, what was always troubling to me is we always kind of, you know, we create our own language. We create our own, you know, sort of way of speaking or it's code, right? And it's secretive and it's mm -hmm. insular. And I think that was always, that was the thing that always kind of turned me off on it. It was this idea that, you know, we're, we kind of create our own little bubble and if you're part of the crew, you know, great. If you're not, well, you just don't get us. And clearly you don't even get to participate. Um, and I think that's off-putting for a lot of clients, right? I mean, look, we're a we are a service. I mean, we're a service. We're in this interesting intersection between, you know, construction and art, or at least we like to think we are. Um, but we, we do need to have clients as a way, means of supporting our business or, you know, our ambitions. I mean, without them, it doesn't work. Um, so I, I think that one of the big things is there does need to be a little bit of an ide ideology shift to thinking about that, where projects are maybe more rooted in, in sort of reality in terms of the, the social issues that we're, we're, we're looking at. I mean, I, I know that it's tough to get to a certain level when you have such a compressed timeline of, you know, let's say four or five years for somebody to, to kind of get all of that. There's a lot yeah. thrown at you. But I think the one thing is that it, it, it should be a little bit more based in sort of solving problems that are relevant to today mm. because you know, I, I think that puts people at a disadvantage if you're not engaging in those things. Brilliant. On a final question, I think it's a perfect place for us to conclude. My last question is, what would you say to your 30-year-old self just as they were forming the company? <laughs> what words of wisdom would you pass on? Oh, well, there's so many. There's so many times there's so many times I sit there and I go, what was I thinking? I mean, honestly. <laughs> But I, I knew that there was always, I always had this, this entrepreneurial spirit. It definitely came from my, my upbringing. Uh, it's immigrant, first generation immigrant, you know, sort of ideology. And it was just like, you're going to have your own business. That's just what you do. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I think, I think the biggest advice I would go back is definitely it's sort of like, don't sweat the small stuff, keep it a broader perspective 
the day-to-day -day little things that kind of get you down and kind of move the needle up and down and the emotional roller coaster, it's not really necessary. Um, you know, relax. It's a, it's, it's, there's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, and understand that, you know, um, uh, understand that, that you're going to learn as you go. Um, I think the other thing though, is don't be scared of new things, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, I guess more importantly, you should actually approach this job as a business. And I think that's the most important thing as opposed to just something that kind of happens to you. And so to really think about this is, you know, you need to develop this into something super meaningful. So. Mm. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, how, how have you reconciled that, you know, the kind of creative aspect with the cut and dryness of running a business? Do those two, do, do those two now comfortably exist together or were they surprisingly? Yeah. Surprisingly they do. I mean, what, what's funny is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of see it as its own design problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's some stuff, let me get I mean, like, you know, I'm not interested in necessarily figuring out our 401k plan and what's the best plan that we need to do or picking out insurance plans and all that. But I have to say what's really exciting is like the idea of, of, of literally it's like building something anew, like taking something that's no different than a construction project. You figure out the processes, you try to figure out a way to design it. You want it to be beautiful when it's all said and done, don't you? I mean, you, you want that. And so, yeah, I mean, what I'm excited, you know, is to see what a beautiful business that we're able to create at some point. Yeah. Brilliant. Love it. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your story today. That's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Ryan. A big fan of the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.